Hello, sir. I'm Anand from. I'm doing my bachelor's in chemistry. Yes. Uh, and like on behalf of Team Technish, uh, I would like to wish you a very happy and prosperous New Year. That's and fine. We ex- yes. And we That's extend fine. a warm uh, gratitude for agreeing to participate in this video lecture. Okay. So let's start with uh, the session with a frequently asked question. So, uh, what made you want to take up science, especially chemistry? Uh, was it realizing a childhood passion, or did it grow on gradually? No, I I um, I had to get a job, and I was good at uh, science at school, and uh, I my main interest at school was also art and graphics. <clears throat> and today, maybe I would do art and graphics, but in those days, there were not so many options for jobs in the future. So I, as I was good at science, I just naturally went down the road, and um, I didn't focus on being a, ca- uh, a scientist. I just went to university, mm-hmm. and then I uh, wanted to stay at university, and I did a PhD in chemistry, and then gradually. Um, doors opened up and I went through them and became a, a scientist at university and in particular in chemistry but I, I had no uh, thoughts about it at the start it was a gradual path and um, perhaps even today I would probably go into graphic art and design or maybe architecture oh, uh, that's great to you uh, and so uh, though few of us know about your work it would be great if you could explain in brief what are fullerenes and how you came across them and also the history behind the name. Okay, um, well in the, um, in the mid-70s I was working with a friend of mine at University of Sussex, David Walton, and um, I was doing spectroscopy and looking at molecular dynamics, of the way that molecules vibrated and rotated. A sort of imagine the vibration of skipping rope, you know. And wow. uh, David Walton could make long carbon chains, thirty-two carbon atoms, beautiful work. And I, he and I got together um, and uh, set up a project for an undergraduate to synthesize a carbon chain. We did that. We got the spectra. We looked at the dynamics, and at the same time, um, there were big advances in radio astronomy and uh, one was able to detect these carbon chains in space and then they were detected uh, being blown out of a carbon star and uh, I was interested in in simulating the conditions in a carbon star in the laboratory Um, and with uh, Rick Smalley, Bob Curl and students uh, Jim Heath, Sean O'Brien and Yuan Liu in 1985, um, uh, I suggested this experiment just to vaporize graphite. And when we vaporize graphite to simulate the conditions in a carbon star, um, this 60 carbon atom molecule, which has the same structure as a soccer ball with 12 pentagons and 20 hexagons, self assembled. And that was a big surprise. So uh, it has within carbon has within it a sort of blueprint for um, creating a structure of this kind. Uh, And it was a big surprise. And uh, then uh, in 1990, uh, it was extracted and then it gave rise to a massive area of new chemistry of these round carbon structures. And now there are maybe be 15 to 20,000 papers on the chemistry of C60. So uh, when we knew what it was, or thought we knew what it was, because Buckminster Fuller's ideas of uh, the geodesic domes uh, were, in my mind, I suggested that we call it Buckminster Fullerene. And that's the name that stuck, and that's why we call C60, Buckminster Fullerene, after Buckminster Fuller, the American designer, architect, inventor, who um, developed the geodesic domes. Um, and um, the, uh, they basically now, for the family, they're called Fullerenes. So Buckminster Fullerene is C60, and the whole family is called the Fullerenes. Simpler, 
and little ch children like to call it a buckyball, so that's great. <laughs> well, that was a long way to go and uh, interesting name too. So uh, as you know, sir, uh, well, every discovery or invention are credited with their applications in survival and sustainability. Uh, what do you believe are the important and promising applications of fullerenes in the near future? Well, the first thing I think one has to realize is that this is a fundamental breakthrough. Um, it was not, um, it was an act, uh, sort of a serendipitous discovery. It, we were not expecting this, it was a surprise. And I think it's imp important to realize that. What it, from a fundamental point of view, it told us that this molecules can self-assemble, which was a big surprise. Nobody realized that. And so it now completely changed our perspective on the self-assembly of carbon-based species. That, that's fundamental. That's the sort of thing that will go into the textbooks of chemistry so that one understands what are the driving forces in synthesis and creating species. Um, when it comes to applications, at the moment, there's the most exciting application is that C60, when it is um, doped into uh, organic or plastic solar cells, it improves the electricity production by an order of magnitude. And that's a very exciting possibility because the, in the future, it is possible that we could use printing press technology to create large sheets of thin plastic which cover a large area to produce electricity from, uh, from the sun. So the most exciting application at the moment is the solar electricity uh, production. Okay, and uh, so if you see there are like hundreds of research groups working to find an effective way to deliver drugs. Uh, do you think uh, fillerines can be used as a drug delivery vehicle or like yeah. where do you stand? I think so. It's uh, an exciting possibility because you can put an atom on the inside and it's trapped there. In most compounds, um, the at atoms are bound together by bonds, right? In water, oxygen and hydrogen are bonded together by a hydrogen-oxygen bond. Um, in most molecules, um, there's a bond between the carbon and an oxygen or a nitrogen or a metal. What the C60 and the fullerenes offer is something special that you can trap an atom physically inside the cage. Now that means that if the atom is um, toxic to the human body, then you can separate that toxic atom by putting, say, uh, groups outside the fullerene. Um, which are hydrophilic, and so it becomes soluble. You can put other groups on the outside, and this is the dream, it's not been achieved yet, which are recognition moieties, which can recognize maybe a cancer t cancerous tissue. So the dream is, here is a cage, tag the outside with a moiety or a, a group which can um, attach itself to a cancerous tissue, and on the inside, you have a, an atom which is radioactive and can irradiate just at that spot where the cancerous tissue is. And that's one of the exciting possibilities in drug delivery um, uh, that people are now working on. Well, so yeah, that does seem so exciting. Um, and you have worked on a number of fields over the span of your career. Apart from fullerenes, have you ever preferred or enjoyed any particular one specifically? Have I particularly any what sort of work? Uh, it's like over your career, you like uh, worked in different fields of chemistry, from uh, organic to astrochemistry. So, like yes. apart from fullerenes, finding fullerenes, have you enjoyed any other field? Yeah, I mean, I I think that my the area that gives me most satisfaction um, is my work on carbon phosphorus double bond and triple bonds. Um, in the uh, mid 70s, I was w before the work on carbon in in space and radio astronomy, and the fullerenes. Uh, uh, we made at the University of Sussex the first carbon sulf uh, carbon phosphorus double bonded molecule, 
These were the phosphoalkenes and the triple bonds, the phosphoalkynes. And this was a project with my colleague at, um, at Sussex, uh, John Nixon, who was an expert on phosphorus. But um, I'd been working uh, earlier on on carbon double bonds to sulfur and carbon double bonds to selenium. And uh, I would wondered whether one could create a, a double bond between carbon and phosphorus. And we were able to do that. And that particular breakthrough gives me gr the greater uh, personal satisfaction because uh, I had worked out how to do it. I wanted to see how could I solve this problem. And we did do that. And it gives me more satisfaction from an intellectual and a scientific point of view than the discovery of C60, which was accidental. It, we didn't know it was there. Of course, later work on fullerenes, um, when I was able to find a reason for the stability of fullerenes, that also gave me a lot of uh, satisfaction. But I think the, my favorite paper is the first paper on the first carbon phosphorus double bond. <laughs> Okay, yes, so and uh, you were fundamental in giving a new shape to carbon chemistry, and uh, were also awarded a Nobel Prize for such an important discovery. Were there any notable changes in life or research after you were awarded the Nobel Prize? Well, I always gave a lot of lectures, and uh, because um, the radio astronomy was a very good hook to get young people interested in chemistry. So I gave a lot of lectures on that. But of course, when the Nobel Prize came along, uh, people outside the field of chemistry started to um, be interested in what I had to say. And I am um, a, a very strong supporter of secular um, issues, of humanitarian and humanist issues. And I believe very strongly in the separation of church and state. We cannot have democracy if um, decisions, judicial and government decisions are made on the basis of dogma. So when the Nobel Prize came along, I was certainly um, started to uh, work very hard for humanitarian issues and the secular uh, uh, significance of, demo of for democracy. And I think uh, these are some of the um, responsibilities that I've taken on. Another responsibility is for education. I think it is impossible for the future uh, health of the world uh, if uh, far too many people are, are uneducated. And so I, my major effort now uh, is to uh, explore ways in which the Internet can be used to improve the general level of education in the community, in the world in particular. Yes, uh, that's really great. So, and uh, well, to most students, when you say Nobel Prize, that means Nobel uh, money too. So, uh, most of the students were interested to know how you utilize this prize money that you were awarded. Yeah, I mean, some part of it um, I have used to set up um, the Vega Science Trust, um, which is, um, if you go on the web, it's a, a, a website which um, uh, has got lots of Nobel Prize winners. And uh, for some 15 years, uh, that w is a major archive now of uh, scientific educational material. Um, parts of the money, uh, some have been used for humanitarian um, charitable charities, such as uh, Amnesty International um, and uh, secular and, and humanist organizations, uh, the Center for Inquiry, uh, where we try very hard to work for the separation of church and state in government and judicial issues. But not all of it, <laughs> because um, some of that funding um, has been to help uh, our children um, in these very, very difficult periods for uh, young people to get jobs. And uh, so some of it has gone into, uh, a part has been gone into making a film with uh, Ian McKellen, who is Gandalf. Um, and 
And uh, so uh, you've heard of it, Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings. He and I went to school together in the same year, and uh, some of the funding has gone to make a rather nice film with him. So the, the, the funding has been used for several purposes, for education, for charities which are focused on humanist, uh, secular, um, and uh, sort of democratic principles, and also um, film of, the, uh, of that is quite a nice film. So, well, that's very thoughtful of you. Uh, so, and uh, though research is fun and interesting, there are times when it's difficult to get back on track once fallen. Uh, well, what motivates you in the field as well as life? Well, I always have many, several irons in the fire. Um, in science and research, very often um, it doesn't go the way you expect it, or sometimes it doesn't go anywhere at all. So my uh, approach has always been to have more than one iron in the fire, uh, to have one, two or three research programs. And also um, not to be too conservative because um, I, I like to work uh, here with other people um, and collaborate. Um, you know, I've, I've done a lot of research now and today I'm only collaborating with colleagues here at Florida State where uh, I bring some expertise that they don't have bring ideas on they have ideas in my area and what one finds is if one works hard that something works and if it doesn't work it sometimes works in an unexpected way and you learn something so in a sense it's um, it's like uh, chipping away keeping going uh, fighting uh, Muhammad Ali every day of the week <laughs> and getting knocked out in the first round and occasionally getting to the second round so uh, it's determination. But also I have other interests. I have my educational program. The major one now is GEOSET, Global Educational Outreach for Science, Engineering and Technology, GEOSET. And uh, Indian students have been very good at creating their own programs. I'm now working to record um, research students uh, talking about their projects. And that is helping them to get uh, jobs and scholarships. Um, I, I also am um, interested, as I said, my main interest in life is art and graphic design. And uh, we've um, produced a book. I don't know. Uh, it, it, can you? Is this the right one? Can you see? See something yeah. here? Yeah. I, well, but I, well, I can't read the words. Well, you can't. Really. This is a, a. These are some of the drawings with my younger son. And this is some of the artwork. This is Gandalf, and here are some of these things, and they're all around here. So there's a lot of artwork around, and um, I think um, uh, the, this is uh, sort of things, other, there are other things in life to do. I think it's very important not to be one-dimensional. And for me, um, I used to play a lot of tennis. Um, I, um, I, I give a lot of lectures. I gave 90 seven lectures last year, 91 outside the country. I, we were in India earlier in the year um, and China. Um, we, we go to Thailand and Vietnam in a week's time. So I feel I've got lots of things. I feel a responsibility to talk to young people about the things that concern me, about the way the world is and to fight for their democratic rights and fight for their education and fight for their um, them to be allowed to doubt and question their teachers and other people. So there's plenty for me to do. Um, if science isn't going well, and it, for some reason it's always gone reasonably well, and uh, I think I've been very lucky to to do things. But also, I've never followed other people. I've always done what interests me. I've never I've never jumped on other people's bandwagons. Um, you know, if, I, if, if there's a field that's very hot and hundred people working on it, then you've not got a very good chance of making a breakthrough. Someone will do it, but you've only got a statistically a 1%. My 
research has always been what I wanted to do, never what other people are interested in. Well, I mean, sometimes it has been, but I think it's very important uh, in research to develop your own personal interests, and then you are one person in one, not one in a hundred. So, um, well, that was helpful, and I guess most of the students would take that in a similar way. Well, I think um, they should be aware that science is um, is a very special uh, subject. It's not just <clears throat> the uh, the knowledge of the way the universe works. It is that. It's not just that, but it is main. It is that. It's not just the applications of that knowledge to iPhones and cameras and whatever and food and production. Of course, it is that's very important. It's not just the way science moves forward, the scientific method, the way we discover new knowledge. The most important aspect of science is that it's actually part of natural philosophy. And natural philosophy is the only philosophical construct the human race <coughs> has developed to understand and recognize what is actually true. So it's about truth. And therefore, it's an ethical issue. It's an educational issue. And every young person should be taught how they can decide what they're being told is actually true. Now, that doesn't mean that things that are run through are not important. There are many things that people believe which are not true, which are important to them. But when it comes to education, and when it comes to government, and when it comes to social responsibility and social issues and democracy, truth has to be the most important and fundamental factor. And the scientist is different from all other people. Musicians create music. Artists create their work. Scientists work in something else. They work in the universe, which we didn't create. And it's the way it is. And we should recognize that. And that's the difference between the scientist and everybody else. That's true. Uh, so finally, is there any message you wish to convey to the budding researchers in IIT Guwahati who aspire to reach the levels of great scientists as such as you? Well, the first thing is they must realize that I never set out to be a great scientist. Um, I say I, my parents were refugees from Germany. I had to get a job and I was good at science. I wasn't the best in the class. I was, I don't think I'm the cleverest guy I've ever met. I, almost all the students I meet, I think are as clever or as intelligent as I am. Um, I have uh, one thing that not everybody has, and that is determination. I never put in a second-rate effort. If, I, if I'm satisfied, if I'm doing something where second-rate effort is satisfactory, I'm not going to do it. It's not interesting to me. I've got too many other things that are important to me, and I always put in a second-rate effort. So it, whether I do this and set up, I come in, I come in an hour earlier to do a Skype interview. I make sure as best I can that everything works. If I give a lecture, I go an hour early to make sure sure that the technology is right. If I give a lecture, it's the best I can do at that time. I might work till two or three o'clock in the morning. If I'm doing research, I will do the best I possibly can. If you're doing second rate effort, then that's not going to work. But I want to stress that I did not set out to win the Nobel Prize. I did not set out to be a professor. I, went, I was good at science and I got a job. And then I thought, well, I'll do research for five years at university. I was offered a job at the University of Sussex. And I said, I'll do, I'll do it for five years. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to go out and go to night school and go into graphic art and design, which is the area which I feel most comfortable and most at home. But my research went on well. And then I thought, well, look, I'm doing, I've done some nice work. Maybe I should be a professor. And I became a professor. I'm, I'm not somebody who aspires to anything. After I've done something, then I think, oh, maybe I deserve some recognition. But I didn't set out to win the Nobel Prize. Indeed, the experiment that we did 
was an experiment that was interesting to me and not very interesting to other people, not even to my colleagues. It was actually a, this particular experiment was really a pilot experiment for some other experiments later on, but they were interesting to me. The pilot experiments were interesting, but the next step was interesting to my colleagues. So I want to stress that the, the experiment that led to the Nobel Prize did not seem to be a very important experiment until after it was done. After it was done, then, well, then it became very interesting. And after five years, lots of people thought it was interesting. And then the Nobel Prize came on. But I never set out to win prizes. I never set out to win the Nobel Prize. I set out to do a job as best I possibly can. If you have that attitude, you will not be disappointed. You will be relatively successful. And if you're extremely lucky, then you may win a, a prize and get a scholarship. But I was never looking for an award or a prize before I'd done something, right? You understand? Yeah. No point. <clears throat> How many people can win the Nobel Prize? It's I mean, it's just almost nothing. So there's no point going into science to win the Nobel Prize. You won't win it. The nine out of ten, or more, there will be people who go into it and possibly win it, but they're very few and far between. Of the thousands of people who are scientists who say, I want to win the Nobel Prize, 19, 999 are going to be disappointed. What's the point of, of living your life like that? None whatsoever. Uh, that's true. Um, so I guess uh, that's the end. And uh, so we'd like to thank you. And. It was pleasure having you with us. So.